Welcome to Mercatus Radio, Episode 2. I'm your host, Sylvain Perrier, President and CEO. And joining me in the studio today is Mark Fairhurst, Mercatus's own Senior Director of Marketing. Welcome, everyone. It's great to be back. And at the board, as always, is Kevin Glenn. So, Mark, today we have a subject that I am just super excited to talk about, and it's the big moves and the importance of M&A in grocery industry. And I think, you know, from, from our experience, looking at what's happening in the market, this space is just changing at such a rapid pace, yep. right? You Absolutely, have yeah. the new entrants. Yep. I, they could be technology companies. They can be kind of hybrid scenario. We have companies that are just fighting over a share of a wallet, share of basket. So there's these kind of food delivery startups, Just Eat, Uber Eats, Ritual. And yep. I think every city and every state has kind of their own flavor of such organizations. And I can tell you, you know, my own experience, just like a, an m and I wouldn't call it a direct process, but just seeing it happen from afar, I can remember back in, I think it was 2013, I was working at Giant Eagle in Pittsburgh. A great company to work for and to, and to do stuff with. Um, we were helping them out on their digital strategy. And I remember the phone call coming in direct to the office to uh, the former chief operating officer. His last name is Luco. And there's two brothers that work there, Joe and John. I think it was John. John's probably one of the strongest operators I've ever had the opportunity to work with. And he rushes into to my little cubicle that they had given me and goes, did you hear the news? And I'm like, they will hear what news? I'm like, this has got to be dramatic if the chief operating officer is coming down to see me. <laughs> and I can hear our guest laughing, which is even better because he knows what this is like. <laughs> John's like, uh, well, Kroger just bought Harris Teeter. And I'm like, what? Kroger just bought Harris Teeter? Why, why would a large tier one grocery retailer want to buy... I will tell you a great regional retailer, right? For, for those of you listening that don't know who Harris Teeter, who they are, they're headquartered in Matthews, North Carolina. I think at the time they had over 200 stores and they're phenomenal and they bought them. And I'm like, well, that's odd. And then, you know, you, you start to wonder, is it to grow revenue? Is it to get expertise? Is it to block Publix who is slowly punching through uh, the state of Georgia? They were contemplating open up a distribution center, I think in the Carolinas at the time, and they had opened up a store in uh, Greenville, South Carolina. But nonetheless, it was an experience. And when I look at what's happening today, it's a little bit of the same, but it's a lot new. It's a lot different. And I think a lot of because this, this is being driven by customer demand, being driven by people wanting to survive and thrive. And so there's a whole host of reasons. So to help us really explore this subject, we have on the phone a reoccurring guest on Mercatus Radio, Britton Ladd. And for those of you who don't know him, this guy's just brilliant. He gets it. He's an independent consultant, amazing strategist, gets all things retail, all things technology, and all things e-commerce. So welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be back. Excellent. Now. I always say when, it, when I think of this subject, there's these two dividing lines in the sand. And, and, and it's odd, you know, there's normally only one line in the sand, but I think in this case here, there's two. There is, in fact, Kroger acquiring Harris Teeter in 2013. And you could get a sense that the tide was shifting. So it was more so less about revenue growth, maybe about something entirely different. My experience with Harris Teeter at the time, and most people don't know this, but I actually lived for over a year in Charlotte, North Carolina, in a beautiful part of the city called South Park, not like the cartoon, <laughs> completely different. And as the Canadian in the area, I didn't have that head that just kind of, you know, split in between at the mouth level, just bobbing up and down. Great area. And we had, we had a Harris Teeter not far from us, from our gated community. And it had a nickname, and they called it the Taj Mahal of Harris Teeter. So on site, they had a sommelier. So you could go in and buy a bottle of wine, and the sommelier would recommend to you the wine. He had a recipe book. He had the recipe cards. If you wanted to get a cut of meat, you could talk to the butcher. And the experience was very different. Also, from an e-commerce perspective, they were doing, I think, well. They seemed operationally far ahead of the game of most. Produce was amazing. So you kind of wonder, maybe that's why they got bought. That second line in the sand is the news that was announced in December of 2017 with Target making the decision to acquire Shipt for 550 million US dollars. 
astonishing. And for a company, I think it's reported on Crunchbase.com that they I think they raised only twenty million. It's an amazing return if you were an early stage investor. So I want to ask our expert. You know, prior to these lines in the sand, why why was there M and A activity in this space? Why would a, one retailer buy another retailer? Well, you know, what's interesting. Again, we kind of touched on this in the last podcast, but. The reason why retailers were avoiding each other is there really was a belief that if you operated regionally, you actually had the advantage because Walmart was looked at as being the 800 pound gorilla that was going to be a nationwide grocery retailer. And so to avoid being swept up and losing market share to Walmart, focus on the customer at the regional level. Find a way to personalize that experience more at the regional level. The challenge was those were words to most of those executives at the regional level at that time. And although they would say we're really working hard to please the customer, they really weren't innovating. They really weren't backing up those words with action. And so for that period of time where you didn't see a lot of M&A activity, not a lot of innovative things were taking place within the grocery industry. And so when you look in this space today and you've seen the changes, what are some of these changing that's just now driving the M&A activity through the roof? Well, you can't talk about M&A activity today without saying the word Amazon. And... I can state for a fact, with no hesitation, that when Amazon announced they were acquiring Whole Foods, executives at every grocery retailer, as a matter of fact, executives at most retailers, went behind closed doors and they asked this question, how did we miss this? How did we not see this coming? And what I, I always like to do when I talk about M&A is touch upon that subject to begin with. The question that needs to be asked is, why was it so many executives were surprised by Amazon acquiring Whole Foods? And when I mean surprised, there are executives at very well-known grocery retailers who are on the record as stating, I would have never thought, or I never thought Amazon would ever acquire a grocery retailer. I thought Amazon would focus on online grocery retailing. So what Amazon did was disrupt. They disrupted the equilibrium that had been in place within the grocery industry. And now that Amazon acquired Whole Foods, grocery retailers are looking to the left and right and saying, my gosh, I really can't just be concerned with the competitors I work with on a daily basis or I compete against on a daily basis. There are companies completely outside of my industry who have an opportunity to come in and make an acquisition. So what these retailers are doing today is doing everything they can to improve their competitive position. And right or wrong, what these executives believe is that if they can make the right acquisition, they increase their ability to compete. What I actually see happening is that there are executives who are making acquisitions, but they're really not acquisitions that I think are going to help them that much. And then there are other retailers out there who are still on the sidelines because what they've done is said, yes, Amazon acquired Whole Foods, but we're not convinced Amazon is going to be able to make Whole Foods be as big as a competitor as they say. And I think that is just a terrible mistake. That's interesting you say that. So I, I will tell you from experience through my business partner and through acquaintances out there in the market, that it really takes a special type of executive committee, board of directors to make an acquisition, right? It's not so much just about an all cash transaction, share swap, kind of all those types of things that you can do. There needs to be a very strict process of how you merge an organization operationally, culturally, and to have them sing from the same strategic song sheet, really. So in your estimation, who's out there today that knows how to do this and is likely, I would hope, executing flawlessly? I tell you, I really look at Target and I think Target does and has done a fabulous job in terms of their acquisition strategy. 
I think they do a great job. I certainly think Amazon does a wonderful job in terms of acquisitions. I think Walmart does an excellent job in terms of acquisitions. And the reason why I call out those companies is this. They understand where they have gaps. And when they make an acquisition, it's to close the gap. Why did Walmart acquire Jet.com? Well, Walmart just wasn't happy with their e-commerce digital capability. And they acquired expertise, Mark Lorre and his team. They acquired technology through the Jet.com platform. Then today, Walmart looks at, at India and says, we're really not competitive there. We need a better strategy. So that's why they're investing heavily to acquire a majority stake in Flipkart. So those are the companies that I think are doing very well. Amazon, I won't be surprised to see them make an, an additional acquisition. I'm on the record as stating I think Carrefour would be a great acquisition for Amazon to make in Europe. I actually think Walmart should have made a play. Just a few months ago, I wrote an article where I recommended that Walmart should divest ASDA and make a play for Carrefour. Now, I don't see any movement on the part of Walmart going to car four and because now Walmart is actually looking to make an acquisition of Flipkart. I, I believe the best strategy for Walmart and all I see is just to withdraw from Europe completely and put their focus on India, China, Mexico, and the United States. I think they should withdraw from Brazil as well. And so you could have a conversation like that with the executives at Walmart, because as you state, they get it. They can align to a strategy. Kroger is the company that continues to amaze me that they've yet to make an acquisition. And I believe there are several out there that they should make. And I'm on the record and everyone knows this. I'm the person who recommended that Kroger go after boxed wholesale. And I'm also on the record as stating that Kroger should have gone after overstock.com. Now, Kroger did make an attempt to acquire boxed wholesale, but they didn't bid anywhere near as high as I recommended. And I've yet to see Kroger make a play for Overstock, although I think that'd be a great fit for them. So I agree with everything that you said in terms of making acquisitions requires a strategy, but making acquisitions requires having an executive team with the courage and the vision to be able to make such a decision. Perfect. You know, the one thing that's always frustrated me about being in this space is, you know, you're vis visiting a prospective client and you, you have a group that says to you, we're never going to be the first at this. And I have to ask, what's going to happen to those retailers that continue to say that? They're going to close their doors or they're going to be acquired. If you look at the graphic that's used for this article, M&A activity, it's a big fish swallowing a small fish. And big fish grow big because they learn survival. They learn to understand where are they competing? Where do they fit into the food chain? And they make wise decisions to get bigger, to survive. These companies that say, we're not going to be first at this. I can think of no worse attitude to have than that. I just can't imagine being someone who can look in the mirror and say, I really wouldn't want to be the first to climb Mount Everest, but you know what? If I was a second or third person, that would be okay. The glory goes to those individuals, to those companies who have the courage and who have the vision to do something big. And one of the tenets, one of the leadership principles at Amazon is think big. And another one is have backbone and commit. And that's what it takes. You have to have executives with a backbone and with vision. And for these boards of directors who sit in a room and they have a, a CEO who says, we don't really want to move first. We really want to sit back and wait and see what happens. Uh, I have advice for those boards of directors, and it's called firing that CEO. Excellent. Now, from my perspective, when I look at some of the companies today that are not necessarily participating in call it the flurry of activity that we're seeing in the space, right, between Target, Walmart and Amazon. I'm wondering, are those that are on the sidelines hoping and anticipating that these companies are going to trip up? Are they trying to learn from them? Or are they eventually going to resurface and jockey for a position? Or maybe they're just hoping that they will deplete their cash position and not be able to execute. And I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on that. 
So let's take a look at an example. If we look at Kroger, Kroger signed an agreement with Instacart. Kroger has is leveraging several other third parties for grocery delivery. So Kroger didn't acquire Shipt, for example, and I actually made the recommendation in June of 2017 that either Target or Kroger should acquire Shipt. I thought Kroger absolutely should have gone after Shipt. They didn't. Kroger chose what I call the path of least resistance, and that's not a criticism of the executives at Kroger, but it wasn't the best decision in terms of a strategy. So I think what Kroger is doing is saying, let's tiptoe. Let's tiptoe in the waters. Let us have an ability to make deliveries for our customers, but let us not really be the company that goes out and creates our own capability by partnering with someone. And let us not be someone who says, well, we're going to go make an acquisition because we're not 100% sure what's this really going to do? What's this, how's this going to turn out in the end? I see Wegmans, I see Albertsons, I see other companies leveraging Instacart and leveraging other third parties to basically give them an ability to compete today. Now that's today. That isn't a long-term strategy. So what I continue to see with these grocery retailers on the periphery is that they're doing just enough to keep the train moving forward but I've yet to see any of them do anything where I look at it and say, yes, they're going to be here five years from now or 10 years from now. I still see that level of hesitation. And I can assure you that's just not how I would operate these grocery retailers. I just think they're doing the least possible thing they can do and they're incredibly risk averse. And I just don't operate that way. And when you look at the successful retailers, the Amazons, the Targets, the Walmarts and so forth, they go for it. They are not risk averse. In my world, I've, I've always seen that as this is the difference of doing acquisition strategy against a really well-crafted process to understand, well, strategically, we need to go here. Let's go get the talent and the expertise to do it versus us doing it on our own, versus what you're so well explaining is bridging the gap at a tactical level. And let's just put a bunch of pieces of the puzzle together and hope it works. And at some point, someone's going to buy that piece of puzzle, and then we're going to be left with that gap again and have to make good on it. And that's very dangerous to try to uh, run a business on this way. And this, this reminds me, in my years in the electronics industry, in my years in supporting the banking industry, that we've seen this not work out in the long run. Oh, and and I agree. One of the, the more popular articles I wrote for LinkedIn is called The Trojan Horse, Instacart's Covert Operation Against Grocery Retailers. And it was amazing to me the feedback I received when I wrote that article. And my argument is this. Grocery retailers that signed an agreement with Instacart are doing nothing more than teaching Instacart their business and they're giving Instacart access to their strengths and weaknesses. And if all Instacart wanted to do was maintain their business model and be happy delivering groceries, there's nothing wrong with that strategy. But I am convinced that Instacart absolutely is going to move into wholesale grocery distribution. I think Instacart is going to move into private label manufacturing. I think Instacart absolutely can open up their own stores. And as Instacart grows, their market increases and their valuation increases. They really look like a target for someone to acquire. So imagine someone, a third party, a private equity firm says, let's acquire Instacart and let's leverage all the strengths and weaknesses they know of the top grocery retailers in the United States and let us come to market with our own vision of grocery retailing. Now, right out of the gate, they're going to know, well, this is how you beat Kroger. This is how you beat Albertsons. This is how you beat this customer. This is how you beat that, that company. And so I really believe that grocery retailers need to bring these things in house or grocery retailers need to do a better job of choosing who they partner with. What you don't want to do is partner with someone who can learn your strengths and weaknesses and eventually use it against you. I just think that's a very bad strategy. And for the response I've received in the article, I had CEOs, I had boards of directors reach out to me and say, had I read this, 
Prior to us signing that agreement, we would never have signed that agreement with Instacart. So I know what I wrote had a lot of truth to it. Yeah, and, I, and to add to your story, I can remember, I think it was back in, in 2016, being in the LA market with a, a retailer that's no longer part of the retail community. I was on my way to an afternoon meeting at their head office. And what I typically do when I'm traveling to and eventually have a meeting with a retailer, I like to go visit the stores. And I tend to go alone. I don't like to go with the, the marketing team or the IT team because the store staff just know it's, oh, head office is here. So you don't get a good sense of how the business operates at that point. And I was blown away when I walked in and I saw a bunch of Amazon employees picking and packing orders. And when I made my way to head office and I said, no, you... I understand you're looking at implementing your own e-commerce solution, prepared orders and click and collect and curbside. I think that's great, but you didn't disclose to me that you were working with Amazon. Are you concerned about that? And they, you know, they, everyone in the room kind of looked at me like, well, why should we be concerned? Amazon sells books. (laughs) And I, and I, and I, and I looked at them and I kind of like, no, they don't your margin is their opportunity, right? You have to understand that Amazon's goal in the world is to sell more products. And grocery has the highest household penetration rate in the United States. I think it sits at north of 95%. And if they can learn from the data harvested from selling groceries to their customers, they will learn how to sell more and how to do more. Everyone kind of looked at me like I was right out of it and i said you're teaching them your space you're literally teaching them how to be good at this the moment uh whole foods uh was acquired i think it was a space within a a week or two that this retailer had to file a chapter seven and that was it and uh you know the demise didn't come because of the acquisition of whole foods or or amazon learning but it came from the executives not really wanting to be truthful with themselves and introspective and so on and so on, all those things that go on. Now, Brittany, if you could look at your crystal ball, because I suspect at this point you have one, (laughs) what do you see and what are you anticipating for the future? Well, what I really see is massively increased M&A. And I see certainly more partnerships forming, some good, some bad. And... What I really look at is Amazon is going to do wondrous things with Whole Foods. And I've been on the record for several years. And for the audience members who don't know this, I first recommended Amazon acquire Whole Foods in 2013 when I wrote a research paper on the topic. And so I look at Amazon and I say by 2030, Amazon Whole Foods absolutely will surpass Kroger and be the second largest grocery retailer in the United States. Between 2030 and 2035, Amazon absolutely can surpass Walmart in terms of total market share for grocery. Amazon has that capability. Now, does that mean no one can stop them? Uh, No, actually, there are some very interesting things that could take place. The wild card is Alibaba. And last year, there was a lot of press on this because I had written that I believe Alibaba should acquire Kroger. And if Alibaba acquired Kroger, there's many things that that Alibaba could do to re-engineer, to reimagine grocery retailing as we know it. And that certainly could have an impact on Amazon's ability to succeed. I look out there and I say, well, what if Costco decided they wanted to get more into groceries And they say, we're going to acquire Kroger. I've been on the record as stating if Target and Kroger merged or if Target acquired Kroger, that absolutely would have an impact on Amazon's ability to achieve the goal. And of all those recommendations, not one time did I have anyone ever reach out to me and say, that's crazy, that's a bad idea. They always reach out to me, especially executives of Wall Street firms, and they ask me, why hasn't this already been done? Why hasn't Kroger and Target already merged? Why hasn't Costco already reached out and acquired Kroger? So what I believe we'll see is that 
there will be more acquisitions along the way. And I don't anticipate Amazon having a major impact that will be felt by most retailers until around 2020, 2021. So there still may be a period of one or two more years where there just aren't the big acquisitions that I think are going to happen. But when it becomes a reality that Amazon is not just good at grocery retailing, but they're actually becoming a leader at it, that is absolutely going to put the fear in many executives. And that's when you're going to see these big acquisitions. Also today, for example, I see that Starbucks has signed an agreement with Nestle and to sell coffee. And that's something that I've written about in the past. I've also written that I believe Starbucks should acquire Blue Apron and sell meal kits within their stores. And so again, when you look at acquisition, where are their gaps? If you look at Starbucks, they don't do a good job of selling food in their stores. So acquiring Blue Apron could actually help them solve that problem. So I believe you're going to see many more retailers out there be aggressive and say, we are willing to be acquired or we are willing to partner with a, a proven winner or we're gonna find that company that can have some disruptive capability. But I look out there and I think Target absolutely will continue doing what they're doing. I think they're doing a great job. I think Kroger needs to ramp up what they should be doing, but Walmart and Amazon for the US, absolutely, they're gonna be very strong players for the years to come. Yeah, and I would add to that, you know, strong brands have the best opportunity to go global. And I think we've seen that historically with Pepsi's and the Cokes of the world and the McDonald's. And certainly the Starbucks brand is a global brand for sure. And I think the grocery retail industry needs to understand that to become good and to survive in this space means you have to acquire the experts. And those experts are not always going to be domiciled in your backyard. And you have Correct. to become culturally adept in learning how to transact and do businesses in other parts of the world. And without that knowledge, I don't know how, how you proceed to move forward in this space. Oh, I agree 100%. I agree 100%. Well, I wish I had a peek in that crystal ball a little bit more often. Britton, always a joy talking to you. Can you share with our audience, how do they get a hold of you? The easiest thing to do is simply look me up on LinkedIn and reach out to me. I'm always responsive to anyone who reaches out. Perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, don't forget to tune in to our next podcast where we're going to be tackling a very interesting subject, Mark, and it's called The Infinite Game in Grocery Retail. Mark, can you share with our listeners, how do they get hold of us on Twitter, on Instagram, and on Facebook? Our listeners can reach us in any number of ways at www.mercatus.com. All of our social channels are listed at the bottom of the webpage. On LinkedIn, it's Mercatus Technologies. On Twitter, it's at Mercatus Tech. On Instagram, it's at Mercatus Culture. And on Facebook, it's Mercatus Technologies. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.